I'm grateful. <laughs> Amen. What a powerful sermon. I'm grateful for this fellowship. I'm uh, grateful for tremendous opportunity that I'm allowed to preach this morning to you. Thank you, Pastor Mitchell. If you have your Bibles with you, please go to uh, 2 Samuel 23. I'd like to read there starting at verse 11 until uh, verse 16. Alvin Matulesi is a, is a missionary in uh, Indonesia. He told me a story he visited recently um, Vietnam and he, he told me the story about this encounter with the couple there, the missionary couple, Eric and Roxanne Barriantes. I was very intrigued because I don't know much about that part of our fellowship that we have churches even in Cambodia, Bangladesh and, uh, and Vietnam. He says, uh, Vietnam still has a lot of strong communistic oppression, a religion is prohibited, um, uh, people however are very interested in the gospel, they're not interested in communism, they want to survive, they want to eat, their, uh, their, um, their soul is, is, is hungry and they're very much interested in the gospel but missionaries have to be very careful there they have a, a church I heard it's on the on the third floor it's a bit hidden away the entrance uh, people are only allowed when they are brought with a Christian then they can go into the building uh, there is a combination number lock and uh, that's the way that they enter into the church only when they uh, visit the church more regularly then they are trusted and they get also uh, the combination lock to enter in that church what was most uh, standing out to me is the story how uh, this couple um, came into Vietnam and they felt an intimidation there the the, um, uh, the lady she would be in a, in, in a supermarket uh, with her cart there and people would be very rude and, and one person just pushed her and her cart aside because she was a foreigner and uh, she felt very bad about it, the way that she was treated. She uh, came into a taxi, the taxi driver, uh, extremely rude, ripped the money out of her hand practically, uh, was not helpful at all and she felt very intimidated. In the same day, uh, the pastor was um, evangelizing and the way that they do that there is they give English classes he was at the university and he was trying to invite um, um, uh, students there for English classes they hold English classes and then they use the Bible as a, as a textbook to teach these people English and then they find out who's very open for the gospel and they bring him to the church but police is there only the police is, uh, is very difficult to recognize. They don't wear uniforms. They, um, they are uh, undercover. Um, with a little experience, you can recognize them mostly. Uh, they look at foreigners very sharply, mostly. They're dressed pretty good. And so uh, that was the case there also. One of these guys is there present. He is looking at, uh, at the pastor and he's asking sharp questions questions what are you doing here why are you giving these English classes why are you giving these English classes for free and the pastor felt very intimidated so in which direction is this gonna go and he felt prompted by the Holy Spirit on a certain moment that was his conviction and that's what he heard he felt prompted by the Holy Spirit to respond also uh, by asking questions and he asked that guy and he said, hey, who are you to ask me that? And what, is, um, uh, what are you doing here? Um, uh, what is your profession? And so the guy answered them and said, well, I'm just looking for a job. And the pastor told him, well, you are not looking like somebody that's looking for a job. Look at you, you're, you're dressed nicely. You probably work for a foreign company or probably you work for the government. And in an intimidating way, he was asking some questions to that police officer undercover. And, uh, and, and that uh, police officer just, just backed off and, um, and he had the victory 
on that moment. He came back at home, uh, shared the story with his wife, and he and his wife, they concluded from, hey, there's a spirit, there's something working against us. There's an, a, a demonic attack, an intimidation that's working against us, and, and, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, Pastor Eric was able to respond in the correct way uh, to push back uh, that spirit. I'd like to read uh, 2 Samuel uh, verses 23. Uh, we see there the same spirit. It's the story of uh, Shammah. The Bible says there, And after him was Shammah the son of Haggai the Hararite. The Philistines had gathered together into a troop where there was a piece of ground full of lentils. So the people fled from the Philistines. But he stationed himself in the middle of the field, defended it, and killed the Philistines. So the Lord brought about a great victory. Then three of the thirty chief men went down at harvest time and came to David at the cave of Adullam. And the troop of Philistines encamped in the valley of Rephaim. David was then in a stronghold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. And David said with a longing, Oh, that someone would give me a drink of water from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. So the three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines, drew water from it, and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink it, but poured it out to the Lord. I'd like to speak this morning about pushing back, the power of pushing back. And first, I'd like to speak about the pressure and the promise. So this text, it speaks about a field and there's uh, turmoil, there's pressure around that field. And that's an image of the church. It's an image of a starting church. It's an image of our lives and of the destiny and of the plans that God has for your and my life. There's, there's pressure there and God wants to help us to have victory. I met Kincaid, he's a pioneer pastor in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, we had a conversation with him and he said in Malaysia, normally speaking, uh, spoken, people work there uh, six days. They have to work very long days, easily every evening until seven o'clock or later. And he says that interferes with my calling because I tried to plant this church. He is uh, um, uh, educated in software and he went for a job interview, couldn't get a job in his field, but he was... Uh, uh, being interviewed to be a salesperson. He said, when I went into that interview, I knew exactly what I wanted. He said, I have to lay down my demands. And so he spoke with the owner of that company and he said, I'm willing to work for you. I'm a good worker, but I will only work five days. And at the end of the day at five o'clock, I will go home. And that's something unheard of in that culture in, um, in Malaysia. But that is exactly what he did. He said, if you'll try me for a month, you won't be sorry. And the owner looked at him and he said, I like that. And he took him and uh, he became a worker there. And that is exactly how things went. Uh, the owner is very happy. And Kincaid made this remark, if you, if you do not make those demands beforehand, you will be a slave of the company. You will be a slave of the boss. So, so he is, is, is pressing back and, and, and like pushing back um, releases a blessing upon our lives. Our text says the Philistines had together, had gathered together in a troop where there was a piece of ground full of lentils. Then the people fled from the Philistines, but he stationed himself in the middle of the field and defended it and killed the Philistines. He stationed himself in the middle of that field. The Bible says it was, it was harvest time. It was a place filled with lentils, and he is risking his life for that. Personally, I would not risk my life for lentils. I'm not very uh, charmed with lentils, perhaps for Brussels sprouts or carrots or beans. But anyway, lentils in that culture in those days, they, um, they had a great value. It's an, it's an image of promise. It's an image of promise and fruit for the church. It's an image of destiny for our personal lives. 
He stood on this piece of land. A piece of land would be an image of, of, of a place that we gather through, um, uh, that we gain through inheritance or that we um, become an owner of through a lot of work in order to get a fruitful field. So you have to remove rocks and tree trunks and you have to plow it through and only then you will have a field that will be fruitful. A lot of work, a lot of labor has been done for that and it's a place of, of dominion. It's a place of something that we, um, that we made our own. It could be an image of our personal lives where we have learned areas of discipline that we have conquered upon the flesh in our lives. Places and areas where we have victory over our fleshly nature. Areas where we have learned to have faith and, and, and to give, to be, to be liberal. We have learned to be bold in testifying and, and stepping out in faith. It's an area where we have learned uh, as a church to plant, cosp to plant the, um, a go a couples, perhaps even overseas. It's something that's been given to us, something that God gave to us. It's an inheritance and there's a lot of turmoil and there's a lot of pressure on that. And when we're making steps ahead, there's always this force coming against us. In Revelations, the Bible speaks about the church. In Revelations 12, 4, the Bible says, And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. It's an image of the church and there's a dragon and there's also this, um, this force that comes against the church just like this couple experienced in Vietnam. There was something working against their mind, especially when they came there in the first month. It was a spirit of intimidation. In Holland, we have a lot of uh, different cultures and uh, a Colombian lady, precious Colombian lady in, uh, in our church, loves God. She feels a little bit insecure about her Dutch and uh, she shared with me that she went on the street to testify for the first time. She had prepared herself, prayed about it, really wanted to do that. And then she had a few conversations. And then all of a sudden she says, I had this conversation with somebody. And that person responded to her, reacted to her. And he said, who are you to tell me to convert? You don't even know the Dutch language. And she said that, that, that really hit me. It was, a, it was a blow. It had a tremendous impact on my life. Um, she didn't want to go on the street. It took her months to, uh, to dare again to evangelize. And so it's a demonic strategy. We, we try to step out. We try to do something for God. We, we, we plan the church. We uh, try to do something new. And, and there's a force. There's a demonic force coming against us. In Judges 6 verse 3. The Bible says, so it was that whenever Israel had sown, the Midianites would come up, the Amalekites and the people of the east, they would come up against them and they would destroy um, 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 the seed uh, that had been planted. That's the, that's the force that comes against us. So secondly, I'd like to speak about pushing back. By nature, we are looking for the path of least resistance, like a river meanders. It means it, it twists left and right. It, it, it avoids the, the, the pieces of hard rock in the soil. In Holland, interesting scientists say in Holland that our efforts to make clean air in Holland have gone to an extreme. They say nowadays the air in uh, industrial chimneys in Holland is cleaner than the air that we breathe. Can you imagine that? That's, that's extreme. And that causes problem. It means that wheat and vegetal, ve vegetables, they don't grow so well as they used to grow. Because wheat and vegetables, they need sulfur. The scientists say our bread nowadays has less taste because of clean air. The Brussels sprouts, you know, the ones that I like, they become smaller because of lack of sulfur. So the greenies, they have spoiled our food in Holland. They're making my life and my diet miserable. 
All because some people want to have clean air. Well, we need something that's a little bit foul. There's something um, in, in um, uh, or is that the wrong word? It's a little bit dirty, let's, that's the better word. There's something in, in resistance that makes things better. We heard a story about astronauts. They go in the air and space as well-trained athletes, and after a month without gravity, they come back to planet Earth and they hardly can stand on their own feet. There's something healthy in resistance. In modern Christianity today, we see that same spirit that wants to avoid resistance. They try in every way to avoid confrontation. They lower their standards. They lower their morals. They want to be, become acceptable to the modern culture. They adapt themselves to the modern culture. Vans Hafner a long time ago already said that the modern church does so much her best to be relevant to society that she became irrelevant. She lost her spiritual influence. So in our text, we find this truth. Shama, um, he, he stood on the piece of land and he pushed back. He didn't bend. He didn't move to the side. He resisted. He pushed back. Interesting story that I read about the uh, um, beginning of the nation of Israel. Ord Windgate was an English officer in Israel in the 1930s. In those days, the Jews would live in kibbutz. They were developing the land. They were busy uh, uh, um, uh, plowing the fields, getting the stubbles out of the fields. And they were, they were making that nation a beautiful nation with those Kibbutz, but they were constantly attacked uh, because of the Arab villages that were around them. And they didn't dare um, to defend themselves. They didn't know how to defend themselves. Uh, in nighttime, they were attacked by these uh, guerrillas and they were just hiding in their houses, hoping that the attacks would be, open so would be over soon. Now, this man, Ord Wingate, he was an English officer, was also a devoted Christian, and he loved the Jewish people. So what he did, he started to train small groups of young men to counterattack the Arab guerrillas. They called them the special night squads. Out of that later grew the Haganah, the, the Jewish army, and he would walk with these uh, intimidated, scared men through the night. One night... He would, uh, he would stand up. Everybody was very quiet. Everybody was very uh, careful, very timid, very afraid. And then on a certain night, he would stand up and he would turn towards these uh, Jewish men and he would scream to the top of his, lung, of his lungs, Why are the sons of the Maccabees afraid? Any of you is stronger than 20 or 30 or 100 Arabs, any of you can put them to scare and put them to flight. And he was instilling in them this spirit. You can push back and you can make a difference. Um, one of the men, one of the young men that was trained was Moshe Dayan, uh, the, the general leader. Moshe Dayan said, he taught us everything that we know. He changed the spirit and the attitude that, that, we, um, uh, that we have in life. And I believe, and I'm convinced that this is the spirit that is, uh, that is in our fellowship, that makes our fellowship different from any other um, denomination. I'm proud of our fellowship. I'm proud of the stories that I hear left and right. Uh, about a year ago, a missionary couple uh, was put out of China by the Chinese authority. And uh, what a great announcement it was to hear that uh, very quickly later on, they were uh, sent out to go to Taiwan, right on the doorstep there of China. Like, like, like you push us out and, and we push ourselves back in. We know the story of Pastor Warner just after he and his wife were sent out. There was this tragic car accident. Some people in the church doubted if planting churches was God's will. And Pastor Mitchell, the next server, service, asks for couples with a calling to step forward. And numerous couples came forward. And uh, they did everything to send them out as quickly as possible. Like devil, you try to stop us. 
but we push back. We will not be intimidated. That's the spirit of our fellowship. But there's pressure, pressure from the church world, pressure from culture, culture on our young people. Uh, in a few weeks' time in Europe, I don't know about the States, but the college year will start again. And typically, new students, for them, there's an introduction week. Supposedly, they say, we want to uh, let you uh, know the school, but it's, um, it's, uh, it's, it's a bacchanal. It's all about uh, drinking, uh, immorality, um, they, they play games. I heard of one of the girls, they said uh, they, they, they have a quiz and if you do not answer the, the question correctly, you have to take off a piece of garment and, and, and stuff like that. That is, that is the, um, the pressure that is upon the young people. There's a strong current in the school system to uh, investigate and explore the sexual identity. And there's people going to our schools, they're asking the students and, and, and putting them to think, perhaps, perhaps you're not a heterosexual, perhaps you're a homosexual, you should think about it. Perhaps you're a bisexual, perhaps you uh, are uh, some sexual, but you need uh, another body. Like, um, <laughs> if you're not confused, uh, we will confuse you. And then, and then they, they want our youth to accept that as normal thinking and normal behavior. And then a teacher will ask in a class, is there anybody here that has a different opinion? See, and that's challenging. Then we have to step out and we have to open our mouth. We have to say something. A young man in our church asked me about the story of Cedric, Meshach, and Abednego. And they asked me, what, what pastor, if, if they would have... Uh, bow down. I mean, if they, if they had said, well, there's a, uh, there's a lot of pressure here. I'm going to lose my life. What, what if I just bow down and, and, and ask uh, uh, in a prayer for forgiveness? Um, what do you think of that? Well, I, I answered him that personally, I do not believe that the fire of judgment would have fallen on these three young men. But I do believe that if they would have bowed down on that moment, they would have to bow down somewhere else again and longer and again and again. There is no other way. You have to push back. It happens in every Christian's life or you will be run over. Pushing back is, uh, is part of a, of a Christian identity and of the Christian church. Romans 12 verse 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and what is the perfect will of God. In verse 1, uh, Paul says here, I beseech you, brethren, I beg you, brethren, I plead with you means that, I urge you. He says, please, please do not be pressed in the mold of this world. Extrusion is a, is a certain technique that with a lot of pressure and with a lot of heat, you can press uh, material, aluminium even, in a certain mold. And Paul is begging us, even though the heat is hot, even though there's a lot of pressure, do not allow yourself to be pressed into the form and to the mold of this world. In our city, we have a so-called Christian High school, sometimes you just want to bring your kids to a public high school. The education can be, can be sometimes even better there. But this is a so-called Christian high school. And they had a so-called Christian stand-up comedian. You have to be careful with those guys. And uh, so on a certain moment, this stand-up comedian, he's making fun of different kinds of worship, of different churches. And so a girl of our church uh, was looking at that. And she said in herself, he is unrespectful. He, 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 he does not have any, any awe for, for God's presence, for, for worship. And she was upset by what she saw, what she heard. So she stood up and she walked out of the crowd. Um, 
girlfriend of her, actually a, a Muslim girlfriend, agreed with her, went also with her out of that crowd. Other students, uh, they were moving in their seats. They didn't like a lot of it neither. In the break, the teachers gathered around the girl and, and they asked her, why did you step out? And she explained. Uh, other students also came there. They didn't like it and the teachers agreed. They told the performer, you are done. We don't need you for the second half of the show. And this has been the last show on our school. It is powerful because these teachers, they don't have um, a strong opinion like that. It took this Christian girl to make a stand and to push back. But amazing is if, 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 you, if, you, if you make a stand and if you do something uh, that is amazing to other people, how much people will respect that and how much people will stand behind that when you and I are those persons to push back. Pushing back means that, that we refuse to be humiliated, that we refuse to be uh, pushed in a corner, just like the couple in Vietnam. We have a biblical example of that in Acts 16, where Paul and Silas, they were flogged, they were beaten, they were thrown in the Philippian prison, but they worship there and God opens the gates with an earthquake. The magistrates, they get very nervous about this man. They send a message, hey, you can leave the city. And I listen to the response of Paul. Paul says in Acts 16 verse 37, Paul said to them, they have beaten us openly, uncondemned Romans, and have thrown us into prison. And now they put us out secretly. No, indeed, let them come themselves and get us out. He says, you want to scare me out of the city with my tail between my legs, but I refuse to be treated like that. He holds his head up high and he says, you have to come yourself and then you can accompany us out of the city gate and escort us out. Now, why does he do that? It's not because he has such a big ego. He has a healthy ego, but he wants to learn uh, or teach a lesson to these uh, officials. And he also wants to instill something and teach something to the, uh, to the church there um, that they do not have to accept everything that is thrown against them. A few years ago, with our church, we were with a, a team in, uh, in, in Romania. That's not so far away from Holland. And so we go there regularly when we were um, in Timisoara with Pastor Nico Tudor. This is the same city where resistance started against the communist dictator Ceausescu. Here, they, um, uh, they ended uh, the communist uh, dictatorial rule. And uh, here's Nico Tudor. He told me he's, a, he's a, a, a pioneer pastor. He is a carpenter. He says we would be on the street with uh, music amplified. And again and again, police came. They harassed us. They gave us a hard time. Uh, very unfriendly. Uh, police sometimes forget that communism days are over. And so they are nasty. And so he um, went to look in the legal system. He went to look for laws and rights. And he found an old law. He says there was an old law that um, uh, amplified noise is allowed even without a permit for activities involving culture, sports, and religion. And so with those arguments, he went to court. He didn't take a lawyer, but he spoke himself. He had um, um, uh, studied. He came with his arguments, and to everybody's astonishment, the judge ruled that Nico stands in his rights. So he didn't have to pay any fine, and from now on, he doesn't have to get any permit in his city. He has total liberty because he says, I've had enough. And I believe there's something better for me. And he's pushing back. Now the policemen in Timisoara, they know his name. They have tremendous respect for him. He just rejects the position of being an underdog and he pushes back. And not only that's great for him, but he gives his jurisprudence, the jurisprudence to the other uh, pastors in his nation. And they all benefit from that. 
And there's a spirit, not only for that incident, but there's uh, something that is released. His, his church is in revival. There's a tremendous spirit there. It's growing. Uh, just like in our Bible story, when we have that spirit of pushing back, the power of God is released. And I want to close with that, drawing God's attention. Because in verse 12, the Bible says, And the Lord brought about a great victory see these churches the one in Timisoara the one in Vietnam they are doing very good there's a there's a blessing there's a presence of God because of the spirit that is present in that pastor and in that church and it draws God attention God started to move for in for um, started to move for these people so we have to come to a conclusion that um, uh, there's always pressure on us to move with the culture, to move with our flesh, to um, uh, give in to comfort zone, culture, flesh, uh, family pressure. But we can also accept the challenge and say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to resist that. That's the reason that, that we fast. Uh, we fasted last week. We, we resist and we push back against our flesh. We push back against our culture. We push back against um, uh, Christian mediocrity. And there's something there in the Christian realm or in the spiritual realm that draws God's attention and that releases his blessing. James 4, verse 7, the Bible says, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. I heard about the... They will, uh, they will look in the morning and they will try to find lions. Lions have been hunting. Uh, and when um, they find a lion that has just killed a zebra or an antelope, they will go for the lion. And then the story is that three or four of these Messiah tribal warriors, they will walk slowly but firmly in the direction of that lion. And so the lion sees these three men coming towards him and um, he gets a little bit confused. This is not the normal order of things that people approach him. And so on a certain moment when the people are very close, uh, the lion just runs off. The tribal warriors, they cut a big piece of the meat and then they continue quickly before the lion comes to grips and says, hey, what am I doing? And he comes back <laughs> at them. But there's a spirit there. They say, hey, we will not be intimidated. And it's something that they learned, that they, that they were taught in their tribe. And we have a tremendous, tremendous uh, legacy where we have our pastors. They go before us and they have pushed back and they step out. And, um, and, and, and we should step in that legacy. We should step in that same spirit. See, a victorious Christian life can never be found in a life of tolerance and compromise. But a victorious Christian life can only be found in a spirit that is willing to push back. See, when looking at, um, at Shama and, and, and uh, um, uh, the second part of the text that we just read, uh, read is that, is that he got a taste for that. He got a taste uh, to do things um, in that way and with that spirit to push back and not to allow and to go for more. You need to develop a taste for certain things, a taste for resistance, a taste for pushing back. In Holland, we have our bicycles. We have about um, uh, 15 million people in our nation, a small nation. Uh, but we are proud we own 17 million bicycles. We have more bicycles than people in our nation. Even I have a bicycle. I don't know exactly where it is, but it's somewhere. <laughs> After many years, I came to the conclusion, what's the use of a bike if you have a car? But most people in Holland, they love their bicycles and they go to school 
Uh, the kids go to school on their bicycle 30 or 40 minutes. Sometimes they go through rain and wind. It's part of their culture. A few years ago, the there was a new race started, a new competition, a new way of bicycle race was started. And it's bicycle, it, the, the, the name of the race is called Bicycling Against the Wind. So this is how it goes. It is, uh, it is a race that is run on one of our dikes on the, on the coast uh, where it's very open. When there, where's, the, where's the sea? There's a lot of wind. Every participant will only get... Uh, a bicycle with one simple gear, just a normal school bike, no 21 uh, gears, just one gear. Uh, it can be run only with the right circumstances. It means uh, there has to be a stormy wind, at least wind for six or seven, and then the race is on. And then you see these guys, they go against the wind, uh, they blow to the side, sometimes they have to step off the bike, snot flows out of their face, and, uh, and they, they go for it. They go against the wind, and uh, they laugh, they have a good time. But that is, that is the spirit, let's, let's go and let's push back. And this is exactly what Shama is doing with two of his colleagues, because verse 13, the Bible says there, Three of the 30 chief men went down at harvest time and came to David at the cave of Adullam. And so we know the story that David would like to have some water. And these three men, and the Bible commentaries say probably Shama was again one of these three men. They went in, they went right in the middle of enemy territory. Uh, they said, nobody believes that we're going to do it, but that's exactly the reason that we will do it. So we had this spirit, I will go against what other people expect. I will not go as uh, the culture is. I will not go as everybody expects us to behave. But uh, we go for adventure. It's a spirit. It's like an atmosphere that was present there in the army of David. It is an atmosphere present also in our churches. And I'm praying that this spirit of daring will grow more and more in our church. That men will be in influenced by one another to do mighty exploits for God. We know Pastor Mitchell goes, does healing crusades. He does one in Oceanside also for many, many years, famous in our fellowship. I met Pastor Tim Monaghan. Uh, he told me that uh, he's doing his own um, uh, healing crusades also. He went, I believe, last year to Pakistan and did a healing crusade. I'm amazed who goes to Pak, who wants to go to Pakistan for whatever reason. The only thing <laughs> that I uh, read about uh, Pakistan, it's, it's nasty, it's dangerous, but he goes there and he, he says, well, there's areas where people are open for uh, Christianity. And uh, he did a healing crusade just for security measures. He had four, man with, four men with AK-47 on stage also. <laughs> And I believe that's sensible thinking. But isn't that powerful? What other fellowship would do stuff like that? It's a spirit of pushing back to go where nobody else will go, to push against the tides of sin. A spirit that pushes back against the gates of hell. Isaiah 28 verse 6, I close with that. For a spirit of justice to him who sits in judgment and for strength to those who turn back the battle at the gate. So it speaks here about Jehovah. He will inspire and he will st give strength to those who turn back the battle at the gate. That means that we should not wait before we become that person, but that person that turns the battle back, he gives strength, strength to that person. He will change you. He will um, release something in your life. Even though you feel intimidated, even though you feel it's difficult, even though in your church you feel like this is a, a too big step, but if you would act and if you um, uh, would move and if you do make those steps, the Bible promises us, he will give you strength. 
It will become something that will, uh, that will be addictive, that you say, I want to go again and again, just like Shama has been doing it, just like we've been seeing our leaders doing it, and he will place that also in your life. Thank you. That was all that I had.